Um, I think uh, Stefan, nice to have you here. <laughs> and uh, first is actually, what is the story of Stefan? So, so a little bit of of your background and and how you sure. ended up running your own little tech startup. How did that? How did this happen? Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it goes it goes way back to my early days, and and you know, you Rohan, you we, we've shared our life stories many times through Relicad, and. Um, you know, to this day, even more so now, you know, reflecting over the last, say, two years, I think that those early roots um, have been very formative. And by that, I mean, you know, my, my upbringing in, in, uh, in a very loving household of, uh, of three generations, uh, where my grandpa lived right next door and uh, was a, um, you know, integral part of my, my childhood was to, you know, spend a lot of time with him. And uh, he was a very um, traveled and... Uh, like worldly man um, in like the early 50s when that was very unusual in, in Germany. He had started to, you know, travel around the world and, and collect all these wonderful, you know, memories and, uh, and experiences. And, you know, when we grew up, um, he was there all the time. So he, uh, so we had a lot of exposure and he shared and uh, sort of, um, you know, gave us a, a, a little bit of a bigger perspective on, on the world than, uh, than what we would have gotten if we had just sort of, um, you know, been... Uh, in that little village, Bavarian village, where uh, where I did uh, you know uh, go to school. So I think that, that was sort of the earliest nucleus of a sort of a strive to you know explore the world, and um, and that that very much I think goes back to him. And then he was very supportive of all these adventures that we took, uh, taking you know time off from from high school to spend it here in the U.S. for a year when I was sixteen, and. Um, then uh, to take uh, time off from from university um, to uh, to spend some time in Indonesia and in Australia and uh, you know all over all over the place uh, and um, yeah, I think that that has very much you know shaped me uh, and and sort of my experience all, all these sort of international um, uh, you know trips and and journeys. Um, I made a conscious decision post high school to um, go in, into a sort of a tech area of computer science background uh, during my undergrad days and uh, now you know running a tech startup um, are you know benefiting from that on a on a daily basis uh, almost I still am very closely um, you know involved in you know all our development process I don't write all our code anymore but I'm still very much involved and so you know that that I think um, has been a, a very uh, formative uh, experience and um, you know f for me this sort of journey to entrepreneurship uh, it, it came through stages I think early on again my, my grandpa was was very instrumental to you know um, push us to to dare to you know try out stuff and uh, and and you know um, show us that it's okay to fail not that he really failed much in his life he was extremely successful as a as a, as a business person and um, but still he sort of you know pushed us out of the nest if you will and um, and my parents were were encouraging and, and let it happen which which I very much appreciate and um, so you know the the journey to to today was through very much uh, um, you know, sort of many turns and uh, uh, and there's a great quote by uh, by Walt Whitman which I think describes that he says the voyage of the best ship is a zigzag line and uh, and I think that's that's very much true um, you know starting out school in Germany but then you know doing various projects in the nonprofit world in Indonesia where you know Sandra my wife was working at the time who's half Indonesian and uh, then uh, taking um, some time off um, later on to you know join um, Ankur in uh, in Singapore to help work on both Relicad and Nino, and um, so you know always a little bit um, sort of off the, the the very sort of straightforward path. I, I did join McKinsey, obviously, as as you know, post uh, post graduation from from undergrad. And uh, on the tech side, mainly had interned with a couple of other consulting companies before Bain, and um, and enjoyed that. Um, but realized at some point that you know it wasn't really what I wanted to do in the long run. Um, the whole consulting gig. Very grateful, you know, to this day for the learnings I took away from it. Um, but it just wasn't wasn't me. You know, that uh, sense of ownership, not so much in terms of equity, but just in terms of 
you know, owning the piece of work that that uh, that you 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 know invest your time and energy. In. Um, that wasn't there. You never have that as a consultant, and um, that was for me the reason to um, you know take time off from from that life uh, to come to school and uh, dedicate those two years to entrepreneurship already. Um, which is where we, you know, started the business, Kimbrel, and uh, then, you know, since graduation, have been working it ever since. But uh, and and that's sort of the, you know, my my full time occupation now. So it was a little bit of a uh, discovery process. Um, you know, I didn't come necessarily from a you know long term family of entrepreneurs that would have sort of shown me that path, but it was rather a family of um, that supported these sort of. Um, adventures left and right from that sort of straightforward path and uh, and I think that's so what I'm what I'm extremely grateful for um, for all the you know support that I've received along the way I think the the year and a half in the in the military were extremely helpful and are now um, I mean there's a reason why Israel as a as a startup hub is so successful many of their both innovation and um, sort of the you know the discipline and that it takes um, to make a startup successful. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's a really cool insight. Yeah, okay. it has a lot to do with the fact that you know they, they all or many of the successful startup leaders uh, are former members of the of the Israeli army. And I think um, now thinking back, you know, as being an entrepreneur now, I, I do oftentimes think back of many of the lessons that I've drawn from uh, from those from my time in, in the in the special forces. So. I think it was sort of a mixed bag of experiences, a little bit of, you know, you know, McKinsey consulting, a lot of sort of the, the values that I took from my home and my family, uh, the military training, and then obviously, you know, the, the network and the, um, the, you know, type of exposure that I've had do, during the two years um, here at Wharton um, that have helped and sort of helped shape uh, me as an entrepreneur and uh, have... Um, Sort of contributed to that path. And that's a very interesting uh, insight about uh, about Israeli entrepreneurs, and super interesting about your computer science background. Uh, I guess the Steve Jobs thing of uh, you know the dots never connect forwards, but they always tend to connect backwards. Makes so much sense, right? When you think of it. That right, way. right, yeah, absolutely, exactly. It's exactly right. It takes time, right? You can't, um, you don't see it while it happens. It, uh, you, you need to. Let it happen, and then uh, obviously you can make decisions along the way that you know sort of go into one a certain direction. But you only realize afterwards, um, ex post, um, you know how it all fit together. So that makes sense. So so tell tell, tell me a little bit about Kembrel. Uh, what is you know one why do you do what you do? Uh, you know, sure. and two uh, of course sort of how you know and what you know the the story around it would be and and where you see it in in five years. So, so everything about Kembrel. Sure, sure, absolutely. So Kembrel is a tightly integrated multi-channel boutique for independent, small niche apparel, fashion, and accessories. So we started out as a pure e-commerce business, Kembrel.com. Um, launched that in the context of the Wharton Business Plan competition during our first year at school, and then used the summer to sort of build out the prototype. Um, my Two co-founders and I, we didn't spend a single second on recruiting, but we knew that, you know, those two years were dedicated to, you know, starting our own business and, um, you know, and getting it off the ground. And sort of our wish was that on graduation day, we would say thank you very much to the dean, um, you know, turn around, walk back into our office, our own office, and, and, you know, keep working on our business. And that worked out pretty well. We raised a little bit of money uh, at the end of our second year over the summer. And uh, since have been, you know, iterating over the model. As I said initially, it was purely online, purely e-commerce, featuring these, um, you know, unique uh, brands and designers. And um, we we realized that there was a place for for local and for physical retail in our model. Um, many of our customers, um, when we did start to bring on these like small and niche designers that were, you know, Philly based, New York based. We did get a lot of response, but at the same time, you know, you as a consumer, you don't know these brands typically. It's a, sort of this element of discovery that we're yeah. offering our customers, which is great on one hand, but on the other hand, for apparel, there is always the fit issue, right? You don't know how that piece of clothing is going to work for you. And, um, you know, there are obviously two ways. If you're purely online, you have to make returns extremely easy, and, you know, that then shows in very, very high return rates, uh, Zappos, etc., average return rates of over 20%. Um, and that's fine, right? You can just build that into the model, and that's the way you run. 
we went a little bit of a different way. I mean, we, we still make returns very, very easy. And, you know, I think that's the way to do, you know, business online these days as a, as a retailer. But at the same time, we were saying, look, we strongly believe that the choice should be the customers. They should be the ones to decide whether they want to engage with us as a brand online and order from the convenience of their home or whether they want to come in and touch and feel the merchandise. Yeah. Um, they, you know, they typically don't have a jacket from, you know, members only or, um, you know, Will Leather or whatever the like small brand is that we feature. So the fact that they can touch and feel, try it on, um, our customers seem to appreciate it a lot. So we opened a small showroom um, directly adjacent to our office. We had the merchandise for the online uh, business and we had a little bit of space. So just asked a local furniture maker to, uh, to you know, build us some racks and, uh, and, uh, and shelves, et cetera. And open up a little showroom, and suddenly had you know online customers coming in. We you know announced it, and you know had a little opening party, etc. And had had online customers coming in, saying, "Wow, this is amazing!" You know, it's this sort of you know super interesting merchandise. You have the fast rotation, so in our case, both online and in the store, merchandise rotates in and out on a weekly basis. So okay. there's something fresh, something new every couple of days. And uh, at the same time, you know, it's. Um, it's an atmosphere, very boutique-y, um, small-scale, like old-timey care atmosphere um, where you sort of you feel like you're being served by the owner. In the very beginning, that was very much the case. You know, I was in the stores a lot. And by now, we've trained our staff to sort of create that same experience, right? Very sort of small-scale, non-big box, but very small-scale, unique um, shopping experience. And that's what we've where we received a tremendous amount of, uh, of of positive feedback and then decided to open up a second uh, pop-up shop um, in a sort of A location here in Philadelphia and are now working on the third one. And uh, it's, um, you know, basically the now we're, we're more and more convinced that this tightly integrated model um, is uh, creates a more unique shopping experience for our customers. Um, at the same time, we do manage our stores in a way that they break even in the first month by having these, it's essentially a real estate arbitrage game that we're playing there. Um, short-term leases where we pay a fraction of the regular retail cost, uh, sorry, the regular uh, base rent. And, um, you know, for us, these stores serve as a customer acquisition vehicle for the online business. So we convert uh, heavily from offline customers. We are paperless in the stores, so we capture their information and then convert and cross-sell and turn them into online customers. And that sort of joint model um, seems to be seems to be working well. That's what uh, Kimberl is now, this um, you know, tightly integrated boutique so, so um, would, or uh, highly curated merchandise. I guess I guess my question is why would so I, I, I get the small designer. So why why Kimberl? Why would I why would I why why does a customer come to Kimberl? What is unique? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's essentially threefold, right? One is the merchandise. Um, that uh, physically, and that's, you know, we, we ask that very same question to our customers. What is it that brings you back to, to Kremlin? Why do you, especially our regulars, right? Why do you come in week after week um, and, uh, and spend, you know, your hard-earned dollars um, with us? And, and you can, like, argue, right? I mean, retail as an industry is flat. So we're essentially, there's very little growth in the industry except for online. And that, you know, oftentimes, you know, is at the expense of, of offline. So we asked our customer that exact same question. So what is it? Like, why do you come here and, and um, you know, what makes you shop at Kimbrough? Uh, I think the answer is, is threefold or twofold from a customer perspective. And then we have a third sort of dimension behind the, behind the scenes. Uh, the first is merchandise. Uh, it's a unique curated merchandise that our buyers put together um, that our customers aren't able to find in the Philadelphia retail landscape, which is where we have our two stores right now. That's different in New York, that's different in San Francisco, where there is a plethora of, you know, small boutiques. <clears throat> but for us, our, you know, sort of physical expansion um, strategy is very much these tier two cities that have the money, the, you know, appreciation, the demographic, but not the retailers that are offering mm -hmm. that kind of merchandise. So okay. it's, it's merchandise and the fact that it rotates on a weekly basis, there's something fresh, something new. Most boutiques, they change their inventory only three, four times a year, you know, with the change of the season. So that's what, what's drawing people. Second is sort of the, the customer experience, right? As I said, it's this small, old-timey care. They feel taken care of, right? It's yeah. a very much a relationship-based shopping experience. Like shopping has always been a very social activity, and um, people appreciate the sort of type of care that we try to give them when they walk into our doors. 
Um, at the same time, the fact that it's sort of old timey care, like almost like old mom and pop style business yeah. demeanor, but at the same time, it is you know 2012 technology enhanced and yeah. supported. Yeah. So they can you know order something online, pick it up in the store, return online orders in the store. Um, we leverage on the back end, leverage their data to give them more um, relevant shopping advice. So as somebody walks in, they can check in and um, all their information is made available to our stylists who can then sort of see, okay, that what type of customer is that? And then give, you know, according, you know, styling advice. And um, that seems to be, be working well. We're seeing that these sort of styled customers that, you um, um, you know, do a styling session with our with our um, our employees spend almost five times more than a regular customer in store, okay. and which is great for us. But it also means that you know they get better advice and you know yeah. feel that they find you know more more relevant merchandise. So it's this sort of um, experience, just general customer experience argument. And then the third one that that makes the model unique um, from our perspective that's more behind the scenes. So. Our inventory system, for example, is fully integrated. There are no two sets of inventories. Most retailers have, you know, an online warehouse and a, you know, regular warehouse that sort of supplies the stores. <clears throat> in our case, we have no warehouse. We house all our merchandise in our stores. So as an online order comes in, it's a cloud-based fulfillment system. Online order comes in, gets allocated to one of the stores, and then picked and fulfilled and shipped directly from that store location. Okay. So that you know it cuts down on the cost and allows us to leverage um, staff that we have in the store during slow hours that they're able to basically also do the online fulfillment. Um, and then the third one is sort of the, the way we manage our our store operations. As I I mentioned, it's sort of this this arbitrage situation where there is currently, at least here in the U.S. in many uh, many cities, um, commercial real estate is still very depressed. So we you know, make these arrangements with landlords that we go into a property for a short period of time, stage it, uh, invest very little cash um, up front, but uh, are able to um, break even on those um, properties within the first month, which is the biggest issue for many pure bricks and mortar retailers is that it's very, very you know, high fixed cost base, so very difficult to, um, to, to break even um, uh, initially, or it takes a long time to amortize. So there are sort of these sort of, it's almost an efficiency argument behind the scenes, yeah. um, both in terms of inventory integration, as well as the way we manage our real estate. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I mean, it's nice to use the word efficiency. I'm sure your roots, the Germanic roots would be very proud. <laughs> right, right, that's no, right. But, but exactly. no, I mean, I mean uh, it's nice, I mean, you know, what I'm hearing essentially is, you know, it, it, it's, it's unique, it's boutique. Um, of course, you're, you know, it, it's, it's tough as well, you know, as I guess, being running a startup is what what have what have been some of the biggest biggest kind of learnings over the past couple of years especially the past year and a half i think since you've been doing this full time post sure. post mba sure sure yeah i mean we've always been and to this day are a cash strapped operation so initially we were just bootstrapping the business using our own finances and uh, maxing out our credit cards and student loans and all that and um, on one hand, that sucks because you don't have, you know, the money to, you know, spend on customer acquisition and, you know, um, taking Amtrak train to New York instead of the Bolt bus and, and these sort of things. So it's always, money is always tight, right? Uh, it's not as convenient and, uh, you know, you don't grow as fast as uh, some of, you know, as if you were uh, very well funded. So from that perspective, it sucks. The flip side to that is that you need to make do with very little money, and that can be a very good thing, you know, especially as a very early stage business. It's very easy to, you know, bring a product to market and then push heavily, spend a tremendous amount of money and throw resources at it to, you know, get it into the market and, you know, get people to adopt it. But if the product is simply not right, if there is you know lack of product market fit or it's simply not developed enough, a lot of these resources just go poof, right? I mean, you spend a lot of money to acquire traffic and yeah, you know yeah. paid acquisition and all that, all that, but it doesn't convert, right? Because the product's not there. And um, so that from that perspective, it, it has been it has been very healthy, right? We've always been forced to a look at our data extremely carefully in order not to waste resources on um, you know acquisition that doesn't work and that doesn't convert 
And, um, and B, we had to listen to our customer very, very, very carefully and, um, you know, listen, um, try to get as much feedback as we could um, to make the product better. And only now we feel that we're at a place where if we had a little bit more resources, we could jump on a, on a you know, faster yeah. and steeper growth curve. But, but um, you're ready now. But you from, feel ready. Sorry. What's that? No, you feel ready now is, is, is kind of compared <clears throat> to... Well, re ready in the sense that we... You know, we see, if you look at our funnel, yeah. so you know, in, in marketing 101 at college or also in, in, in business school, you learn, you know, this classic marketing funnel from, you know, brand awareness to, um, you know, making a pr consideration to then, you know, actually doing something. And that's for a startup, I think that marketing funnel is just junk. You can't do anything with it because it's not tangible. You can't link it to actions, right? Yeah. So we, we use a little bit of a different funnel, which basically on the top level it has just traffic right how many people do we have on the site right and how many people do we have in our stores it's sort of very top of the funnel and uh then sort of the next level under that is engagement okay how many people of them just bounce right they come but they just you know don't go don't don't engage with the site how many people actually sign up um and uh you know how many people become you know vip members etc which is a program that we're running and uh, so that gives an idea, okay, the people, that, the traffic that we drive to the site, how much of that do we actually capture? Yeah. Um, then the third level is obviously how many of those um, transact, yeah. right? Number of orders, average order value, et cetera. And then the fourth level, how many of those that have transacted once are actually coming back? And what we're seeing is that the conversion from one level of the funnel to the next is actually very decent. We're seeing, especially from people who transact for the first time, our sort of repeat purchase probabilities and all that, they're, they're, they're excellent. Same yeah. in the store, right? People yeah. who shop once with Cambrill, we have a high number of regulars, people do come back. So we're pretty confident that we, we've we built a product that you know people appreciate and are willing to, um, you know, it creates value for them, so they're willing to spend. But we simply, you know, are still a very, very small business in the sense that, you know, hardly anybody knows about us, yeah. right? Very few people, you know, know about Camera.com and the traffic that we have on the site is uh, is not where, you know, it would need to be. So, you know, it's sort of a classic top of the funnel problem. So that's what I'm saying. With a little bit more resources, we would be able to um, at least accelerate that that growth curve. And that's, you know, one of the um, the, the fun exercises, obviously, as an entrepreneur is like, you know, building the product, building the business while at the same time, courting uh potential uh investors <laughs> but um, uh yeah it's uh it's been definitely a a very very uh interesting and fun journey to to this point oh that's fascinating so uh i think uh, kind of final couple of questions one is you know in your day right um are there any quick little productivity hacks routines uh things that you know work very well uh, that you would like to share you mean in terms of like tech tools that I'm using or, or it could, either it could be it could be tech any, tools I mean any yeah. any couple of things that you feel you know, have it was an insight that sure sure well I mean it, it took us a little while to figure out how to make a distributed team work so we have our developers sit in uh, Montreal um, our buyers are in New York at least one of them and um, then the rest of the team in Philadelphia so we've always been like multi-location so that took us a little while to figure out how do we make that work in a productive manner the latest tool that we're using is sort of a combination of it's it's like a shared screens. It's not rocket science, but that that's what you know seems to be working well for us. Um, twice a week, we have uh, our all hands team touch point, where we dial in anybody that's not locally uh, into into Philly um, using Google Plus Hangouts, and um, then on the on the other screen, which is sort of shared with everybody in the room as well as the participants on. On G plus are um, our metrics where we just look at okay how along that entire funnel are are we what else what is working what's not working and what do we need to do um, to to fix it so that's sort of a setup and then we basically do a round robin everybody gives a you know two minute update on uh, what they have been working on and are working on what sort of the challenges for the the um, the, the upcoming week and um, so that's been been working well that kind of like set up to make the team productive um, to come together. In terms of other tools, um, I'm uh, very much sort of a getting things done fan. I know that you've also read the book and are probably following that. So I think that methodology works. I'm not using it um, religiously, let's say, but the general principle of you know having that one place repository of sort of everything that's on your mind and then sort of from there um, pushing it through the 
sort of the, the you know the project management um, uh, channel that that works works well for me. Uh, I'm using Trello. I don't know if you're familiar with that product. No, but I've uh, heard, heard about it. Yeah. <clears throat> Trello.com. So we're using that in the business um, as well as for me personally as sort of a to-do, you know, management system. Um, and I sort of do the, you know, getting things done layer um, or I'm, I'm implementing that system in Trello. Uh, so that's that's working pretty well. Other than that, I'm a complete Google person. So uh, I am on every Google product that you can imagine. My Life is completely transparent to anybody that has access to my uh, my Google profile, um, <laughs> but it simply I feel makes me uh, a very very productive knowledge worker. Um, so I hardly use my mouse uh, anymore. In that sense, I'm like an investment banker. So everything is with like keyboard shortcuts within Google, and uh, so uh, yeah, that's that's been for me like the the golden the golden path. The golden, path. <laughs> the golden D. <laughs> uh, uh, Final question: Any any thoughts, insights, you know, any anything that you would like to pass on? And we, we used to, I used to call this advice to real leaders, but these days I'm I'm less about advice. It's more like any any ideas that you'd like to share. Um, sure, to the, sure, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the, the thing is, you know, re real leaders they they typically they tend to figure things out for themselves, anyways, right? So exactly. it's, it's hard to give them advice. At the same time, I'm. You know, still so young and, and early in my career that uh, I always find it, um, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to sort of pretend that I have the wisdom to share with, uh, exactly. you know, with, with the world. But, you know, just reflecting on what I, what I wish, you know, maybe somebody had pushed me or, or, or told me, I mean, I'm extremely happy with the path I've taken, the sort of that zigzag line that I, that I follow to, to, you know, now my entrepreneurial career. I wish somebody had pushed me even earlier to do that. Um, so meaning, you know, I always admire those people who would like, you know, grow up in a pure entrepreneurial family where they like help at their parents' business. And then, you know, their dads or moms um, sort of like coach them and show them, you know, how, you know, what it, what it means to be an entrepreneur and sort of get that ingrained in their, um, in their, in their sort of DNA as they grow up. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. I think um, you can, even that's, if that's not the case, um, you just need to take chances early on, right? And uh, maybe dare to, you know, leave that sort of secure and safe path um, early on and just take some time off, for example, to try out something. You know, it's, it's a lot easier to do that when you're 18 or, you know, in your mid-20s than when you're in your late 20s, early 30s, you know, to just take some time out. And I did that several times. I uh, took three times during my university career, took a semester off, to um, you know, um, do various projects and um, you know just explore and you know take internships here in the U.S. and uh, in Indonesia, etc. So, um, yeah, I think that that to me is is something that um, it takes a little bit you know guts, and sometimes your parents are not going to be happy about it, but I think it pays off in the end. And um, I definitely saw that now with Lauder. So as you know, I did the dual degree of work in MBA and at the Lauder. A master in international studies and that's really what lauder is all about it's sort of an a group of 70 people who have dared to step left and right in order to um sort of you know, explore and experience oftentimes in terms of different geographies oftentimes in terms of very quirky non-traditional career paths yeah. and i think it shows it shows in more maturity it shows in uh you know a more well-rounded human being personally as well as professionally and uh, so I think that that to me is like the biggest piece. Just dare to be a little bit different. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to go against all conventions and like to do something crazy on your forehead. But at the same time, just dare to like take steps left and right and just you know swing at it. And oftentimes it will be a miss, but um, you will still get a lot out of it. So I think that's you know you know the ability to defend your decisions and and dare to be a little bit different in your in your decisions. I think that's uh, that that really pays off in the long run. Fantastic. You know, really, really nice getting to hear your story.